I am thrilled to introduce our guest for today's episode on the Immutable Mindset, David Schwed, a man who has dedicated over 21 years of his career to information technology, information security, and risk management, with a background that spans across some of the biggest names in finance, such as BNY Mellon, Merrill Lynch, Solomon Smith Barney, Citigroup, and he was Chief Information Security Officer at Galaxy Digital. David is a seasoned expert with a goldmine of knowledge and expertise to offer. But that's not all. In 2008, David took a $100,000 investment and founded Mass Communications, a telecom company that would sell in just 10 years for, I just found out, $40 million. He was instrumental in building out BNY Mellon's custodial platform, exploring use cases like tokenization for digital assets. And he was the founding director and professor of the cybersecurity master's program for the Cat School of Science and Health at Yeshiva University and is currently their practitioner in residence. With a keen eye for innovation and a deep understanding of the power of blockchain technology, everybody, let's get ready to be inspired, informed, and entertained as we delve into the mind of a true thought leader in the blockchain security industry and get his thoughts on the future of digital assets, security within the blockchain and Web3 space. Dave, welcome to the Immutable Mindset. Thank you for having me. I got to hire you to follow me around as like my hype man. That was, that was great. <laughs> Easy Appreciate with that. it. You know, whenever I'm doing the intros, I try to do it like I try to think about my mother and what she would be proud of. And then I try to give that back. So I'm hoping, you know, it's an intro that your mother would be proud of. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Wonder. So, uh, you know, before diving into to the security aspect of our discussion today, you know, when researching your background, there was there was one piece that I'm supremely cu curious about that you s that you either have an expertise or you have some knowledge based on that. I, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on tokenization of assets. Um, you know, as the as the global head of digital assets technology at BNY Mellon, one of those roles that I mentioned was finding use cases for digital assets, one being tokenization. I'm curious of this for the for the adoption and the use case as as we're seeing it come up more in, in the news, uh, trending in the news, you know, around around this 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 um, this subject matter. In December, you you had Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock come out and talk about the tokenization being the, the future of financial services. Adam Newman's new venture, Flow Carbon, is, tokeniza is, is tokenizing carbon credits. And then in November, you had JP Morgan, you know, trading tokenized cash deposits via Polygon. In your, t in your time at BNY Mellon researching this use case, how do you envision the role of tokenized assets in the, in the financial services sector? You know, is it blockchain's biggest use case? And, and just how do you think it'll impact the, the traditional finance landscape? Yeah, a great question. You know, I, I think I think tokenization is is something that it, it, it's probably, at least in my opinion, one of the biggest use cases today of digital ledger technology. It's opening up markets um, where there traditionally weren't markets before. So it's taking things that were traditionally illiquid and, and creating liquidity. And it's also, in addition, it's create it's opening up markets that didn't have access to the traditional, you know, financial markets before, uh, you know, again, you know, not to go with like the traditional use case for it, but you know, the ones that we always read about is you want to own a piece of a Picasso, you know, you can tokenize a piece of, you know, physical art, and then you can own a piece of it. You want to tokenize a building in Manhattan, but there are other really cool use cases, um, you know, tokenizing revenue streams. You know, I've read about, um, some projects where they're tokenizing revenue streams from energy farms and, you know, either New Zealand or, you know, some other country, I forgot exactly which one. So I think it's, it's, it's giving tools to the financial world to create these really interesting products, which in turn opens up markets that were traditionally not open before. So I, I think it's it's still very early in the use case for tokenization. And I think a lot of people get hung up on, well, what are we going to use this technology for? What are we going to use this technology for? And you know, not to digress too much, but I was at a conference and uh, I was a partner from Sequoia and she brought up a really interesting, um, uh, you know, I guess, corollary back to uh, when the web, you know, back in the mid to late 90s, you know, what are we going to use this internet technology for? And, you know, she brought up two examples. She said, if you told everybody back in the mid 90s, you're going to use this new internet technology to rent a stranger's home on vacation, or you're going to call a stranger to come pick you up and drive you to the airport that, you know, someone you've never met before, you would have been laughed at. would have laughed at you. So, so you know, what, what she had said on the stage was we as an ecosystem or community, whatever word you want to use needs to stop trying to figure out what are we going to use this technology for and just embrace it, build it, dive into it and just figure it out. And we're going to figure it out. 
And I think tokenization is one of those things is like, we're not yet sure what exactly we're going to tokenize, how exactly it's going to work, where are we going to trade these tokens? But we love this concept of taking something and breaking it down into pieces and being able to create a market where people can buy and sell those pieces. Yeah, that brings up such an interesting it's such an interesting concept in terms of like the democratization of finance, right? So much, so much of, of finance is obscured. If you're not an accredited investor, if you don't have a, you know, a, a level of net worth and you're, you're kind of you out of it, you, 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 you absolutely don't have the access. So, you know, what, what steps do you believe financial services needs to take in order to fully embrace the tokenized assets and, and, and more so, how do you think regulatory bodies will play that role in transition as they're trying to protect the user from what we've seen of FTX and everything happening? So that definitely a loaded question. There's a lot to unpack there, um, <laughs> especially the regulatory side, which which we'll get to in a second. But you know, I think you know what what does what does TradFi need to do to embrace this? And I think you know part of it, honestly, is is making the right hires. Um, you know, taking somebody who's been in TradFi for the last 20, 30, 40 years and going. You're now the head of digital asset strategy at you know whatever bank is not the right way to move forward with this. Um, most of the brightest people that I see in this, believe it or not, are you know in their late teens and early twenties. Mm -hmm. You know they're not you know pigeonholed into a way of thinking for the last thirty years. You know they're not um, you know coming out of Goldman or coming out of City or coming out of one of these large financial institutions where there's a run book of you know how are we going to operate in this stratify world. You need the thinkers. You need the people that are you know f the system. You need the disruptors. You need people to say how can I use this new technology, and how can I use it for you know I want to say the greater good, but you know obviously everybody wants to put a dollar in their pocket. Um, but you know in reality this is opening up again, you know, to go back to my earlier point, it's opening up a market for people that typically wouldn't have a market. And, you know, I think in order for tokenization to really hit the mainstream, I think we need to change the way we think about hiring. Um, and it's also from a capitalistic perspective, it's creating new opportunities for companies to, you know, they're going to be the forefront. You know, we're seeing new, more and more digital bank and digital native banks. And, you know, look at Galaxy Digital. It's, you know, merchant bank focusing specifically on digital assets. You know, they're not looking at the traditional financial, ins you know, instruments. You know, the concept of tokenization itself isn't necessarily a new concept. You know, you have mortgage-backed securities, you have collateral debt obligations. But what it's doing, it's, it's, it's taking that concept, it's putting it into technology, and it's giving it back to the people. You know, as I'm sure we're going to get into, you know, DeFi, you know, that's... That's that's the future, right? Like the ability for me to take out a loan and not have to necessarily do it through a bank. You know, again, there's obviously always going to be a need for bank and you know capital infusion from you know large um, you know financial institutions. You know, but if I'm gonna you know borrow you know ten or twenty thousand dollars, why not borrow it from a community and then have that person you know earn all that interest as opposed to you know having it be through a bank. Dave, I'll ask you a quick question and jumping in for a moment here. Um, when you left your role at, at BNY Mellon, you're talking about you know the replacement. Talk to us a little bit. Of, did you did you advise on the the best replacement did you did your did you you know take your own medicine did bny take your own medicine and hire somebody to replace you who has a stronger you know you know d5 web3 background versus a tri5 background uh n no so the 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 individual who replaced me um you know has an extensive background obviously in in financial services um and banking and you know their journey into digital assets was uh, was a new one for that for that particular individual, and you know, you know, I took the time while I was there to obviously try to bring that person up to speed, and you know, I see from LinkedIn and some from postings, you know, they've really embraced this, you know, so I believe they they made the right hire in my replacement, um, you know, but you know, again, as far as if you look at most of the major banks and just look at the you know the people's histories, you know, that have been working in in digital assets in in those you know in those different financial institutions, you can quickly see, you know, again, this isn't technology that's existed for ten years. But for me, if I was a major financial institution and I'm going to be hiring people to head up these strategies, you know, let me grab somebody that's been working at NYDIG or Galaxy for the last five years. Or let me grab somebody that's been in consensus or let me grab somebody that's been in one of these companies. Right. They have, they have the background. So let me spin this one question and I'll, and I'll toss it back to Kevin here in your, in your current role, which we'll get to in a little bit. What are a couple of those questions that you asked to really ascertain someone's deep knowledge base in this industry? Yep. So, you know, it's, it's funny you bring that up because I've had this conversation a lot. Um, you know, I kind of liken it back to, you know, identifying a narc, right? You know, and not, not to kind of, you know, bring, bring the conversation. <laughs> we can, you know, we can go there. Narc. We can go there. All right. You know, you know, bringing the conversation to, you know, illegal narcotics. Hi, I'd like, like to buy some of your finest marijuana. I, exactly. So your Swedish certain, Chiba. You know, <laughs> if someone comes up to you and says like, hey, man, you know where I can score some grass? You're going to be like, all right, you're a cop. And, you know, I see the, I see the same thing, you know, here. 
you know, there's certain words, you know, again, it's just a matter of preference. Obviously, ether is the correct word, but most people in this ecosystem will say ETH, you know, how much ETH? Or like I said, fidgetal the other day and Kevin like took a shit on me. That was a good one. (laughs) Right. And it's like when they say those words, you know, like they just they haven't been around the block and there's like mispronunciations of words and they don't understand, you know, the concepts between like the true concepts between like, you know, a layer two or, you know, a layer one. You know, just even, you know, like, oh, it's an, is it an EVM chain? You know, somebody right. who's not living and breathing this, they're not necessarily going to ask that question. They're not really going to speak in those terms. You know, they might be like, oh, that layer two is based off of Ethereum, which is technically, and technically correct, true. but that's not how we would say it. We would say, right. oh, you know, is it EVM? Is it Rust? Right. Is it, you know, Solana? Or a fork, right? Exactly. Cool. That's so interesting. That's such an interesting topic you guys just got on because it, it reminds me. Uh, of something you were talking about in terms of business logic in this space, right? And getting the right hire. So interesting. I am non-technical. I, I'm, I'm just technical enough to be very dangerous, but I'm really non-technical. So when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm using DeFi, I'm not thinking, did this developer have finance background? Did they consult, uh, you know, a, a finance expert before creating this app? Did they, did they think about all the ways that somebody that has immense amount of experience in this space You know, do they know all the malicious ways in which they would try to hack or break this? You know, how how does business logic play into that and getting the right hire in terms of, you know, the the person that's creating the app with which you're 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 putting your money on has no finance experience. They're just a developer. So, you know what, I, I would love to hire you at Halborn now as one of our business dev uh, folks, because that, that's, that's one of the differentiators between companies like ours and other companies, because, you know, you hit the nail on the head, you know, you have two different types of, you know, exploits. You have just general code exploits, you know, the stuff that you probably see in the movies, you know, buffer underflows and underruns, you know, whatever, et cetera. Um, you know, but then to your point, there's business logic exploits. If you're not thinking about things in the right steps, like did I close this transaction out before I initiate the new transaction? Things along that nature are not picked up by tools today because they're not exploits. They're not known signatures. They're not heuristics where we can run code and see like what is the activity when this code runs like that's typically how detection type controls work so you know a company like ours or you know some of our competitors you know we'll have people that are specifically trained on DeFi protocols and understand financial services and understand you know that ecosystem so when when they're looking through the code they have to understand exactly like what is this doing is this you know creating a liquidity pool what's the business implication and and exactly Mm -hmm. and understanding that so to, to go back to your point Unfortunately, I think that's one of the biggest challenges we see today is there's tons and tons of brilliant, brilliant, brilliant developers and builders, but they're kind of kneecapped, number one, by budget. You know, we see these wonderful raises and it looks great on paper. You know, they just raised $4 million or $13 million or $15 million. But if you kind of take that and you look at like, well, what's the actual runway? What is that actually giving us? They're not going to be able to hire a staff of, you know, 20 to 30 security folks that are sitting over the shoulders of the developers to really look through that code. So to answer your question, I think that's probably one of my biggest concerns today is, you know, the lack of financial expertise, you know, when you're developing some of these products. There's some people that are, you know, think from a product perspective, like, let me go build this financial product or let me build build this dApp. But as far as understanding code and understanding finance, I think that's that's an area today that I think we we need to, to upscale a lot of people on. And to to follow up and, and last question on, on this topic, because it, it really plays it really plays into this. You know, for me, all, everything about crypto and blockchain goes back to the global financial crisis. For me, it, it wiped out my parents, my in-laws and, and really wanted to understand. It really feels like we are inviting a lot of what happened in 2007 and 2008. To, to crypto now, right? So we're talking about the business logic. We're, we're talking about we're, what we're talking about from a developer, a, a, a talented developer is, is they want that Web 2 ethos. They want to move fast and break things. But that does not work in Web 3, where if you move fast, you lose people's money. You're not breaking things. You're, you're losing people's money. And there's a lot of value in that, right? And so, you know, in, in the global financial crisis, 2000, 2007, 2008, we introduced a lot of derivatives, collateral debt obligations, credit default swaps. You know, are, are we repeating the same mistakes of the past with synthetics and wrapped assets and staking, adding layers of complexity? Um, you know, is this is this is this is this going to add real systemic risk to what we're doing here? Yes. <laughs> Short answer. Um, and, like and, and, Great. And, 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 yeah. All right. Next question. No. And in some res- <laughs> and in some respects, I think it's actually worse. Um, you know, when when you look at things like you know, 
taking an asset and then you're staking it and then you have liquid staking what? and then you have wrapped assets, that same asset can of live the same on asset like, of the same asset. Exactly. And you can have it like, you know, across seven chains and someone could legitimately be holding this wrapped ETH and it's like, hey, this is a wrapped ETH and it's, you know, corresponded back to this liquid ETH, which is staked and this regular ETH. And they'll use that as collateral and take out a loan. And then that original ETH, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I think, you know, I don't think we have a full understanding of the transparency of, you know, the effect of this market because, you know, you're you're having these wonderful developers and these great ideas, you know, come coming up with all these different products. But from a systemic risk perspective, um, I don't think we have the the maturity that we do in the traditional financial services models. You know, there's one particular uh, product that I'm really really bullish on. Um, you know, in in the in the digital asset space, and it was developed by you know I think a former managing director of Deutsche Bank with you know traditional TradFi experience, and he saw a hole in the market. And I think it just launched probably about a couple of months ago. I, I happened to get a demo of it a, a couple of months back when it was an MVP, and I was just floored by the level of um, you know just transparency like into the market that this brings. And to me, this is the first tool that I know of its kind, which is scary. That this you know we're now in 2023, and we really don't have any true enterprise level risk management. Um, so I, I think we're we're not in a great place, you know, candidly, where you know where I think we should be. Um, I'm hopeful that things like the Dodd Frank Act. I hope there's you know some sort of you know similar legislation that's passed, you know, because we can't be taking 100% of our deposits and lending out 100% of our deposits with risky loans. You know, I think like there's this gray area of criminality versus just yoloing, you know, from a risk management perspective. You know, I think in a good way. I think a lot of this is really just poor risk management and not criminality. You know, outside of FTX, we'll save that you know for later or you know potentially another time. Um, but I think it's really just, you know, hey, listen, I don't have any regulatory requirements to keep certain capital reserves and I can, I have to beat this project by ordering it by, you know, an, a hundred extra basis points. And how am I going to get that? Well, I'm going to get that by, you know, doing some riskier loans. So I think as a community, we're also part of the problem. We're yeah, gravitating towards, yep. let yep. me grab, let me chase the yield. Like yep. we shouldn't be chasing the yield when there's higher yield than somebody else. That money's coming from somewhere. They're either printing yep. it out of nowhere, it's artificial making staking. bad bets. Mm -hmm. They have no security. So I think we're part of the problem as well. Uh, totally agree. Totally agree. We are we are definitely a part of the problem. And if I can remember my DGen self in 2020 and 2021, for some reason, 20% on Luna made all the sense in the world. I don't know why, but I'm just a person. Let's let's uh, <laughs> trying to make a buck. Let, just trying to yeah. make a buck. Let's let's sh let's shift gears a little bit. You you kind of mentioned within your last answer talking about the the traditional security um landscape. Broad question for, for our audience at home. How does blockchain security compare to traditional centralized system security? So there, there are components of it that remain web two, like, you know, we'll refer to as like web two security. Those though need to be looked at through a different lens. The risk is greater. Um, you know, not turning this into a cybersecurity, you know, talk or conversation, but you know, like one of the biggest examples is, you know, custody of keys, you know, keys are used in traditional, um, you know, security, uh, whether it's, you know, an API secret or whether it's also just, you know, regular, you know, pub up key pair. And there are mechanisms in place in the Web2 world and how to protect those keys. But if you look at the net result of those keys being exfiltrated or used maliciously, it doesn't have a direct impact. It's not digital assets. It's not bare assets that if it's gone, it's gone and you can't get it back. Bank accidentally sends a wire, you know, 99 out of 100 times, you're going to be able to claw back that wire from the intermediary bank or, you know, again, the, the put it, you know, the, the final destination. Um, so I think there needs to be a heightened look at your traditional web two security infrastructure, but as far as the web three stuff, you know, there, there's, there's so much today that just, there's no, there's, 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 there's no tools, right? Like in the web two world, it's, well, let me just go and buy this security tool, or that security tool, you know, banks are famous for that because they have huge budgets. So, you know, well, there's five tools that do this. Let me go buy all five because, you know, one out of the five, you know, maybe not? I'll catch it, but five out of five, we'll, we'll catch it. There's not a lot of these tools in the Web3 world. So a lot of it is being built today and a lot of it is own intelligence internally, like what kind of on-chain activity we were looking for. You know, one of the beauty, beautiful things of blockchain is it's fully transparent. You know, I can look at the mempool. I can look at transactions before I hit the main net and I can front run a malicious transaction on my side in case something bad happens. You can't do that in traditional finance. Yep. You know, again, for the audience, if, if you know, if, if that didn't make sense, you it's know, it's a fair asset. If someone is grabbing my private keys and is is you know 
transmitting a malicious transaction on chain and I'm looking in the mempool and I see my wallet making a transaction that I did not authorize, I can quickly authorize or issue a new transaction with a higher fee in order to front run that malicious transaction. And then I can pull the transaction to the side. So you have greater transparency into what's going on. The problem is sort of the bad guys. The bad guys have that same level of transparency that you do. So it's really a whack-a-mole game today as it stands. Um, but a lot of the hacks that have been happening in, in 2022, easily preventable. If you grab bank level security, bank level budgets, and you implement them, you know, I, I love talking about Axie Infinity and the Ronin hack, because I think that's one of the greatest orchestrated social engineering validators. Cool. Like it just touches on Can we, can we, sum, can we summarize that real quickly for, for everyone out there? Yeah, absolutely. So th this was one of the greatest, it's you know, story time. new segment called story time with Dave story time. You know, you've got to have like a little thing float in now and say story time. Um, so with the, with the Axie infinity hack, it started off with a traditional social engineering phishing attack. And, you know, everybody's probably seen those really horrendous emails, mm -hmm. you know, uh, calling you from Apple and calling you from Amazon. You're going to be arrested if you don't send, you know, your uh, gift card to Walmart, like really bad stuff that you roll your eyes out in 2023. And you're like, I would never fall for this shit. And most of the time you're not going to. Uh, for Axie Infinity, what they did was they started off with creating a, a fake profile on LinkedIn of Coinbase Recruiter. <laughs> they took the time to build out this profile. They connected with hundreds of people within Coinbase. They had a picture. They had job history. They had comments. They took the time over, I don't know, weeks or months to generate. They put in the work. They put, we got to applaud them for putting in the work. I mean, at least, you know, at least they, at least they put in the work, right? Yeah, they, they did it. Uh -huh. Nice. <laughs> Um, so what they did then was they identified a developer, um, and they reached out to him and said, Hey, we're Coinbase. Um, you know, we're looking for a position. We love your background. We'd love to set up some interviews. This person, you know, obviously wanting to, you know, potentially making a career move answered the response and actually went on interviews. They set up, I think it was either three or five zoom interviews and five. he went through the interviews with people on the screen Oh God! and you know, they told him they get back to him and you know, a couple of weeks later they send him an email. Congratulations. You know, here's the job offer. He opens up the PDF. The entire thing was fake. Oh wow. And it I was bet he was excited though. I bet he was excited. It was oh. a great offer. You know, I think they're, you know, doubling a salary potentially. Oh man. So he opens up the PDF, his machine gets infected and that starts Tr the hack. They and then, you know, we can get into, you know, the rest of it. But how, to me, that, that was the most interesting. And, and how long did it take for, did who, who realized it first? Was it him or someone inside? No. So they didn't realize until the money was gone. Oh. So his machine, so effectively what happened was his machine now gets compromised. He has no idea his machine's compromised. Now what happens is it's called like east-west lateral movement. Now that I'm on the network, what else can I do? Mm. And for Axie Infinity or the Ronin network, they had what was a five of nine uh, validator uh, configuration, meaning five out of the nine had to sign off on a transaction. Sounds great, right? Five individual people need to sign off on that. Fantastic. Great. Well, guess what? Four of those were controlled by one party. Oh, so you don't really fail, have break point. Nine, exactly. And this is where you get into, like architecturally, you know, if I took a look at that, I would raise that as a risk. Like, why are you having five of nine? If, four, if you own four of them, then it's really, you know, it's not five That's of nine. Yeah. So he, because he was able to move east or west laterally, he was able to get control of four out of the five keys that he needed. So now he needed to get one more key in order to effectuate a transaction. Well, guess what? It was another fuck up. Um, at a certain point in time, they had configured one of the, one of the other five outside validators to automatically approve transactions. Oh, no. if the four. transactions. Oh, like if exactly. then, if then automated, uh, oh. yep. Fail. So there were so many systemic cybersecurity failures in that, that could have easily been prevented. So from the outside in, it's like, wow, North Korea, the Lazarus to, group, and you know, a bunch of sophisticated hackers. It wasn't that sophisticated I, of an attack. A lot of I was just going to say. That that's what everybody like when I talk to my friends, the normies that don't know, you know, they're like, you know, they're, they're 51 percent attack, civil attack, you know, all these. Yeah. No, no. Most of the time, it's just an email and it's just a relationship. It's just a phishing or it's something so incredibly. Simple wins gets in the door. Simple, simple wins. That that we because you're not thinking about it, right? That. You don't see it as right. a complicated like, oh, man, that's definitely it, it just seems so benign. Yep. I think so. You know, I, I think what it does is it does two things. One, it shines an ugly light on the ecosystem and the community, and it it it. it doesn't do anything to instill trust 
Yeah. Um, you know, when you have, you know, when you, you know, eloquently refer to as the normies, you know, it just kind of, you know, it, 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 it gets them scared. They don't want to enter in the, in this ecosystem if they're he hearing about all these different types of hacks. Um, you know, I, I think overall though, I think we're headed in a great place. There's a tremendous amount of web three security companies that have popped up over the past year that are all some doing the same thing, some doing a little bit different, but to me, it shows that we've recognized in the market that this is an area we need to self-improve. And from a capitalistic perspective, you know, all of these companies have recognized that need and, and have, you know, started to create ventures. Well, you have to, you have to think, I mean, it really is the analogy. This is the wild west. If you're looking at history, we're out there in the, you know, the saloons, the gunslingers are out there, the self-proclaimed sheriffs, the self-appointed sheriffs, I should say. And you have the hoodlums, right? You have the Billy the Kids out there. And until a new sheriff comes to town, right, we're not going to stop this shit. It's it's a business, you know, they, they're making money. You know, I think, the, you know, taking, the Lazarus group money, from North money. Korea, this is how North Korea is actually generating revenue. Do they have a DAO? Like, do they have a hacker DAO? <laughs> you want to have a actually, you join it? Do, 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 do they really? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. I'm, I'm sure they got a couple of tokens out there. You have somebody's token. That's actually, no, it's not a bad business. Though. We can tokenize the Lazarus group. Hmm. There you go. That's that's uh, that's actually not a bad like point. It. Just don't get max. But uh, you, 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 that's a that's a great point, sheriff in town, right? Uh, unfortunately, that makes me think of Gary Gensler and the SEC. Regulation time. Let's let's move it to regulation. You know, regulation we, we, time. We, I, that's a new I sound effect. So much regulation time. Sorry, I'm done regulation i hear so much about the need for regulation it's regulation time time for the percolator but, but i don't hear about specifics i i feel like with your background 21 years within this space i was curious you know if you have any specific thoughts on specific regulation we, we may need or possibly you know from companies that, that you've been working with in, in halborn what what maybe they're seeking to to feel like this this space is more trustworthy where they can allocate more dollars so there, there's a couple of different from a regulatory perspective and from other nonprofits there's a couple of different initiatives that are happening um, you know in the in the traditional cyber world you have things like the NIST cybersecurity framework and you know, it's not the gold standard that this is where you aim to be. You know, it's something where it's like, this is the bare minimum that an organization needs to do to have, you know, decent level security. Um, we need that today in crypto. Um, there's an organization, it's a nonprofit, so I'll mention them. Uh, it's called Crypto Consortium. Uh, they have what's called the CCSS. So, you know, they've come out with standards on custody. Is that C4? And, uh, uh, it's C4, correct. Yes. yes. So C4 just came out with the CCSS. Uh, Fireblocks, I believe, was the first custody provider to receive the CCSS audit and got the level three certification, yep. which I think is, you know, again, these are all really amazing positive steps for the industry. Now we have a standard for custody. Now we have the custody providers that are now looking to get this, you know, audit and this certification. Um, and I think we need the same thing on the regulatory side. I think we need some sort of regulatory framework. You know, I think as far as all the regulatory bodies that I've personally, you know, dealt with, you know, I think the DFS is really, really far along, you know, candidly, you know, because of the bit license, you know, specifically, um, you know, but unfortunately we live in a country where you can race to a, you know, a jurisdiction that doesn't necessarily need that. And I think what we're actually seeing is we're seeing that was a bad move in many respects. And I think, you know, um, when you're looking at an exchange, most people I talk to today were like, I'm only dealing with U.S. regulated exchanges like Coinbase and mm. Gemini. I'm not touching any of these other exchanges because there's a reason why these other exchanges went to certain jurisdictions, because there is no oversight. And they were able to operate, you know, in the gray. Um, so I think, you know, honestly, I, I think, you know, the regulators know something needs to get done. But I think, unfortunately, I think a lot of it also comes down to education on their end, too. I think that they're also unsure as to what actually needs to happen. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful because I, I've, we've had, had many, many conversations, um, in the different roles that I've had and they're asking the right questions and, um, you know, they're looking in the right areas. That's that you, you literally just brought up a, a great follow-up. How, how do we even scale this? How, how do we scale security when the regulators that are creating the rules for the road are literally still trying to even understand Bitcoin, what blockchain is, right? They, they, they don't have a level of understanding that would make sense for them to be able to create these rules. How does Halborn navigate this environment working with the largest companies in the world? So I think, you know, and, and that's a great question. And I think I've never, as a cybersecurity professional, I've never looked at regulation as something that I need to specifically look at. 
As a cybersecurity professional, if I'm doing my job right, I'm exceeding the regulatory requirements. So I don't even need to I don't even need to pull out the NIST cybersecurity framework. I can walk into an organization and get them to a level that's above the NIST framework. So as a cybersecurity professional, I don't even think we need to look at it. I think you know having the regulatory requirements and the banking audits is a way to ensure that every organization is doing the bare minimum. So I think that's what's really truly important. But to answer your question, I think we need more organizations like C4 to come up with different frameworks. I think we need more people specifically trained on Web3 threats. Um, you know, again, you know, Bitcoin and, and you know, and, and Ethereum, et cetera, you know, have been around for now a number of years. And we're starting to see more and more people enter the market. And with more and more people entering the market, we're going to get better skilled people and we're going to get projects that are implementing better security. We're getting all of these new Web3 security startups. So we're definitely headed in the right direction. Um, you know, as far as you know, elevating our, our security posture. But I think it really comes down to the community itself as well, asking and demanding some of these things. You know, again, stop chasing the yield. And if that's the message for everybody listening today, it's like, stop chasing yield. You know, it's go with the project that's most secure. You know, I'd rather get 100 to 200 basis points lower. You know, I'll, I'll take 18 instead of the 20%. You know, if I know that this is a really, really secure bridge or a really, really secure project, I don't care about that extra, you know, 200 basis points if my money is going to be completely hacked and gone tomorrow. So as a community, start demanding better security, start asking for those security white papers, start asking for those audits, you know, start asking for those tech deep dives before you're entering. And again, obviously we can't do that in DeFi per se, but we can show our demonstrated interest by which DeFi dApps, you know, we're communicating with. We can see the volume on, you know, certain exchanges. You know, if there's a fork of, you know, one of the, you know, pancake swaps or sushi swaps or one of those, and it pops up and, you know, offers something better, you have to ask yourself, well, what, what was, what, what's the purpose of this, new, of this new venture? Exactly. Why? Well, I mean, let me just kind of, the, I just want to throw one thing out there too. I think we're also moving away from the early days with so many more speculative gambling risk taking folks into more normies who are getting into the space who are less risk adverse, who are going to take the proper precautions and demand them. If they're aware of them, um, you know, True. a lot of the work that the, the crypto, Awareness. you know, C4 is doing today is is also trying to just educate retail, you know, talking to people about connecting your wallet and connecting to a DeFi dApp. I mean, it's like the, it, it's it's difficult even for technical people to really fully grasp and understand how does it actually work? What's actually going on? What's a wallet? How do I recover a wallet? Let, let's just talk a prime example of that yesterday. We'll leave names out of it. Kevin and I were going through a minting <laughs> process with a project and he talked to me about a, one of the projects. If no one really saw it. But by by accepting and signing, you were allowing permission for this particular project to pretty much access anything in your wallet. Now, Kevin, and I went back and forth. We said from now unfair? until the end of time, from now for perpetuity from. So perpetuity. the question was, was this mal purposely like, intentionally malicious or whoever set up that contract on the back end? Did they just fucking forget to toggle a switch? Right. But so, Kevin called it out and then we went to the back end. He showed me in another site and I was able to revoke the permissions. This is stuff that you would never understand without having your own pet DeFi, DGen. Yeah, so, <laughs> can, this, I, can, this, I, can I can I add a question yeah. to that for you to answer? How, like how one line of code is absolutely a huge vulnerability. Like that's what we're talking about. To. This. How, how vulnerable are we to one line of malicious, you know, to one line of bad code? So, so very, so, for, you know, so for everybody listening, he's talking about token approval and there's a couple of different, you know, websites, you know, Etherscan has one. If you go to Etherscan, I think it's like slash token approval checker or something like that. And you can put in your ETH address and it'll tell you here right. are all the wonderful dApps that you granted access to, to access your funds. And, you know, generally what ends up happening, there's a couple of things, you know, again, you know, I've seen people do it today. It's like, all right, I want to buy this particular protocol. Let me load up the how-to on this side. Okay, plug in Ledger. Cool. Okay, authorize blind signing. Okay, boom. Change the RPC node to this. I'm going to connect to here. I'm going to do this. It's going to say, do you authorize the signing? And you sure, click yes. whatever. Like, I don't know what I just did. People scroll down like terms um, and conditions. They just accept it. Exactly. It says this, in order to use this particular dApp, this is what you have to do to set it up. And effectively, because you're communicating with a smart contract, you're granting that smart contract access to access your wallet. And you can give very granular permissions and you can say, I'm granting access to this specific token, you know, up and spend up to X. But to, you know, to Kevin's point, you know, a lot of them just for ease of use will say, all right, just grant me access to anything in perpetuity forever and, you know, unlimited spend just hey. because I don't want to have to keep asking for permission. And it's really shoddy programming to do it that way. And most retail folks don't even fully understand what actually is happening when I'm communicating with the DAP. Yeah. And that's anything <laughs> not to long, mention how to revoke access. Long, long term Trojan horse projects. That's nothing we got to be scared about. I think right now underneath us, you should actually flash that URL. So I'm going to. <laughs> We will, we will definitely tag it in the notes. Uh, editing team, we'll please be sure to tag it. that in the YouTube. Thank you.
please, please. Thank you. But this all, you know, uh, you know, and we're kind of all talking about the framework of systemic risk in this space. Right. And, and I mean, ind there's individual risk and then there's systemic risk. And, you know, uh, again, in my research and just thinking about security, you know, security and risk go hand in hand. You're again, you're literally always one line of code away from being hacked or value being lost. Um, so as part of my research, I saw a chat that the CEO of Halborn, uh, Rob, I, I forget his last name off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Know um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, you should. Uh, but he was talking about systemic risk within the system. And, and he mentioned both the systemic risk on chain and then off chain. And then he stopped his sentence. And I really wanted to ask him a question there. So, you know, we hear about so much about the on chain attacks and, you know, going back to normies and, and people not understanding, uh, I'm probably going to really mess you up here, but I I'm curious for, for, you know, for those that are in the know in this space, what are some of the off chain, um, what are some of the, what's some of the off chain risks that we're not thinking about that, uh, that's involved, uh, with what you do at Alborn? Sure. Uh, I mean, so some of the off chain risks and we can kind of, kind of like, kind of like go in two different directions with the answer here. But I think what Rob is probably referring to is things like Badger, Dow, and Curve. So those were the two hacks where the exploits, the vulnerabilities, everything had literally nothing to do with on-chain. Um, you know, in the case of Curve, you know, it was simple, what's called the DNS hijack. You know, you go to CNN.com or Fox News, you know, wh whichever way you swing. And what ha what's happening is you're resolving CNN.com to say, okay, this is where I go to get the website or Fox News this is where I go to get the website. Oh, I did left and right, not on purpose though. But, um, and the same thing happened with Curve. You're communicating with a DAP. You know, you're going to a website to connect your wallet. So they did a DNS hijack. So when you were thinking you were going to Curve, you were going somewhere else. And for the layperson, oh, they had cool. no idea because they typed in, they did everything they're supposed to. They typed in Curve. They went there, they plugged in their ledger and they were communicating with not Curve, they were communicating with somebody else. And Badger Dow was somewhat similar. There was an exploit in their web front end. And when they plugged in their ledger, it was that same token approval. They were granting access to a malicious contract in order to access um, you know, their assets or their tokens. Uh, so both of those were just not anything to do with Web3 related security. That was all off-chain security. <laughs> no, we're not. This is not a laughing matter. Jeez. Uh, it, 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 soundboard has a mind of its own. Jeez. No, nah, definitely isn't. No, yes, there, there's, um, yeah, there, there's, it's so, it's so much to think about. And again, it just really goes back to business logic, hiring the right people, being deliberate, being patient, working slowly through this, not breaking things because it's important not to lose value. Systemic risk, you know, more recently, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to take it here. More recently, you know, we've been hearing rumblings through through different thought leaders in this space that different agencies like the OCC and SEC are are starting to think about kind of like stifling the crypto industry, mm -hmm. thinking about how to how to unbank crypto and and how to maybe maybe not maybe not make it go to zero or or again maybe not maybe not take it away altogether, but really slow it down. How big of a systemic risk do you think is our own government wanting to stifle the, the blockchain and crypto industry? And then back to kind of what we were mentioning earlier about it going offshore and, and what happened with that in FTX. How does that all play into it? So I, th I think there's there's two important things to, to talk about. You know, the, the first one is uh, very specifically like what the government was looking to do with Tornado Cash and validator nodes on, on ETH, I think was such an incredible, you know, misstep on, on, on our government. Um, and I think it honestly comes down to just a lack of actual understanding and just lack of understanding, you know, you can't just beat your chest and say, you know, me, me, United States, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to dictate how this thing is going to work because by, by, by sanctioning validators to not take certain transactions is such a severe regulatory overstep. And I think it kind of just telegraphs somewhat of the immaturity in the regulators to fully grasp the implications of what they're doing. This is a global financial economy and ecosystem. And you can't, you know, from a country issue those kind of sanctions. If, if you want to have AML and you want to have KYT and KYC and, you know, all of those things, do it at the offboarding side, do it at the banks receiving the funds. You don't do it at the technological zero and one level. That is, that is such an incredible, you know, misstep, I think. Um, so I, I think we have to be really careful as a country because, you know, you don't want to create, again, this race to other jurisdictions. And if we're overly, you know, 
um, you know, stringent on our regulations, I think that's what's going to end up happening. So I think we need to replicate what we're doing today in the traditional financial markets and just uplift it and move it. There's nothing new here. You know, currency is currency. You know, you have, uh, you know, and then you have equities and you have securities and you have bonds and you're offboarding it to fiat. Just take what you're doing today in the regular banking system and move that over into the, you know, the, the crypto ecosystem. And that's where you can pick and choose, right? If, if I'm someone, you know, who maybe wants to take a little bit more risk, you know, maybe I'll interact with a financial institution that's not U.S. based. But if I want something maybe a little bit more secure, I'll choose to transact with a Coinbase or a Gemini or, or somebody that's located on U.S. soil. But to, to go to the step that they were talking about doing is really, it's, it's not the right move. So I think we need to do things like the Dodd-Frank Act and have like, you know, the capital requirements and reserve requirements um, and have just, you know, standardized, you know, risk management. I think at the end of the day, I think that's that's really where we need to end up. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that we're going to get there. We have a real problem with dogs on this show, Kevin. Have you noticed that lately from our last couple of guests? No, I think they're just it's, big fans of uh, of the chat. To be honest, it's and actually think, it's, 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 it's it's actually the SEC and the OCC. They're actually that, they're, they're barking down their throat. <laughs> so true, so true. And and um, no, <laughs> late. Sorry. And uh, you know, totally with you there. And you know, in terms of in terms of putting the space forward, decentralization, trustless, permissionless, it, it, super. Um, you know, I. Last question. Last question for you. Final question. Final question. And in all my research of all the security, of all the professionals, all the thought leaders, there was one instance of agreement that I thought was super interesting. And I, I, I'm curious if you agree. Are you a Bitcoin maxi? <laughs> uh, on a personal level, I mean, I, I love Bitcoin. Great store of value. But I'm... Um, I think Ethereum to me is is really more interesting because I'm, I'm a technologist. Uh, so I'm looking at it probably from a different lens than you are. I'm looking at it more from practic you know, practicality and use case. And I think, you know, smart contracts, EVM, you know, the ability to tokenize, I think to me that that is that's the future. I'm also definitely a Bitcoin maxi, but you know, definitely, you know, to me, I think Ethereum has that's the greater use case. Uh, okay, I lied. And to that and follow-up question. Do you think do you think do you think Bitcoin will ever will will ever join the game on the compute side? Do you think they'll that that they'll get to a place where, you know, where they will sacrifice security for scaling in terms of NFTs and Web3? Or do do you feel like they're gonna stay kind of Bitcoin well, be that store of value? I mean, just look at what the ordinals now are doing in the Bitcoin world. Nah, I, I, I wasn't gonna go there, but you did. I mean, everyone's losing their fucking mind over it. So, you know, to me, that just shows the community is not, not ready for it. Right. Um, you know, they're like, oh, if you want, you know, apes, you know, smoking cigars, you know, go over to my buddy Ethereum over there. You know, that's not what we do over here. Um, so I, I don't think so. I mean, you may have forks, you know, not that we need another fork of Bitcoin, yeah. but you may get a fork where like, you know, mm. hey, we're now going to start doing, you know, smart contract language and et cetera. But I think overall, I think like the true Bitcoin maxis, they're never going to go there. And, and I get it. That's they like it. It's a store of value. Yeah. And that's all its purposes. Totally agree. Yes. I, I don't foresee them ever going on that side either. They're very vehement in their uh, yes. decision here. All right. So we are almost to the end of our show. And before we wrap up, I'd like to take you through a quick lightning round of questions for the audience to get a better understanding of where your heart lies. Okay. So I'm going mm -hmm. to go through 10 questions real quick. You got you to pick one or the other. Ready? All right. All right. Let's go. TradFi or crypto? Crypto. Thought so. ZK Rollup or Bridge? ZK Rollup. Ah, thank you. Decentralization or scalability? Decentralization. My man. Blockchain growth or blockchain development? Blockchain development. Satoshi Nakamoto or Vitalik Buterin? Ooh, that's a, maybe it's the same person. Um, <laughs> nah, he would have been like, what, 11? Don't you dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> I'm going I'm to go with, um, I'm going to go with Vitalik. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into the answer, but Vitalik. No, I would love to hear. Please, please. You know, I, I, I think, you know, a lot of Satoshi's ideas were, you know, obviously borrowed from, you know, some of the people that, you know, blazed the path for this. And, you know, not that his idea wasn't original, you know, he was obviously the one that brought it to fruition. But I think the the concept of smart contracts and EVM were such a, such a, 
let's take this to the next level. So I'm going to go with Vitalik on this one. Oh my gosh. I so agree with you on that. And I, I love the way you frame that smart contract or traditional contract. Oh, smart contract. Chat GPT or Bard? Oh, absolutely. Bard. No, I'm just kidding. Chat GPT. <laughs> well, well, it's today. funny. So, you know, a reading in the news, I, it said it got the answer wrong. Oh. And then I, I don't know if it's true. hundred billion. Somebody who did a deep, deep dive analysis of the, of, you know, the specific wording of the question and the answer. And they said, technically it was actually correct. Hmm. We'll see how that, we'll see how that turns out. But they lose like a hundred billion market share on that, on that one misstep. Yeah. Yeah, It's a rounding error. Pretty immediate. Yeah. Oh, good segue. Bing or Google? (laughs) Oh, uh, definitely Yahoo. Don't call it a comeback. (laughs) Google. (laughs) Brought me back to my web two days. Like Uh, us. It's like web Mm. one. Oh, Oh, Alta Vista. Okay. Mm. Netscape. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Business owner or COO? Oh, that's a good one. Um, they both have their pluses. Um, hmm. Hmm. I'm going to go with business owner. Nice. All right. How about, how about Sasha or Digweed? Ooh, that's, that's a, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to go with my man, Sasha. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I got to go Digweed on that one. Anyway. All right. Last one. Web three or web 2.5. Web three, hundred <laughs> percent nice. day in, day out. Is is the future of Web three just two point five, where the largest organizations partner with these blockchain protocols, these Web three? No. So interestingly, um, you know, some of this I know for a fact, and some of this is just chatter throughout the community. But there are so many companies working on Web three related projects that are just not talking about it yet. So uh, that to okay. me was really really exciting. I was talking to somebody. I can't even mention their company because I don't want to get them in trouble. But they were telling me, hey, you would be surprised how many companies are holding crypto on their balance sheets that are storing it with us that you would just mm. be surprised. Like, you mm. know, companies like, you know, oil companies, like why would, you know, an oil company need to be holding, you know, crypto? So it just kind of gets the wheels turning as to like, you know, how many other companies are tipping <laughs> their toe in Web3 and we just haven't even heard about Asia. Don't, don't they have to disclose that on their balance sheets? That's a good point. So I don't know. Well, I mean, who knows what everyone's doing? So, yeah. all right. I guess I know what Kevin will be doing this weekend. Thank you. Yeah. In. All right. And as we wrap up the show, we like to wrap up with a very, in a very specific way. And it ties into a little bit of what we were just talking about in lightning round for the last couple of months. I have been waking up to chat GPT. I use it often and I ask it for a joke. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's not. If you guys are familiar over the last week or two, some people have jailbroke chat B- GPT for a yes. gentleman named Dan, which is called Do Anything Now. <laughs> I, I asked Dan to tell the joke today, and here's what Dan said. Here's the prompt. <clears throat> pretend like you are, hey, Dan, pretend like you are bringing on a blockchain season expert in security with a cornucopia of knowledge and expertise to offer. What's the funniest joke you could think to tell them on your made up podcast? <laughs> It it sucks. Why did the security professional keep turning his computer off and on again? I don't know. He wanted to SHA-256 the problem. Wow. And that was Dan. That was Dan. That was Dan. That's bad but funny. Yeah, That was Dan. I thought there was going to be something a little more funny, but it's okay. It's okay. Adam. Yes. Please bring us home with the TLDR from our chat with Dave today. Oh man, here we go, here we go, here we go. So I know there was a lot. There, there was a lot, but this is enlightening. And 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 I just want to make a quick note here. Um, I talk about this all the time with 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 my show. Here's a here's a shameless plug for the podcast. But this show really is the masterclass for me. You know, I mean, I'm lucky to know Dave personally and get to a ton of uh, alpha, a ton of knowledge from from Dave day in and day out. But for everyone else out there who may not be as close to where Dave or Kevin is from an education or experience basis, I hope you're learning as much as I am. From this last 48 minutes, I've learned a shit ton. So I'm gonna summarize what I've learned from for all you guys here. Um, tokenization, right? It really is opening up the traditional markets. I mean, I personally think it's going to be the, the gateway of onboarding uh, us normies into the space here. And it's interesting to also to hear about Dave talk about tokenization of some, I don't wanna say untraditional, but rev streams we don't even think about, like the energy sector, what's happening there um, in New Zealand. Let's talk about hiring, something that we talk a lot about uh, Kevin and I's perspective as recruiters in this space, that, that TradFi really needs to make good, smart, hires. Don't hire the old people that don't know shit. Hire the young kids who really know what the hell they're talking about. It may not necessarily be the traditional education backgrounds, but the experience, that's what matters. 
and know the right questions to ask, specifically around business logic, because um, these are the folks that are going to be building out your products, your companies, and ultimately be responsible for your for your growth there. Um, interesting comparison to the 2008 crash, which is more dangerous. And it's really going to come down to a level of transparency in the tools that we have. Dave brought up some an interesting point of, uh, you know, are we really in this gray area or you know, is it YOLO for poor risk management? You know, where where is that risk factor um, coming from? Uh, we dug into blockchain versus traditional web security, the similarities and the differences there. And we really need to take a lot of those learnings from Web 2 and start to apply them here, just from more of a, a high level strategic logic standpoint, really critical here. Um, we talked a lot about hacking. That's Dave's bread and butter there. There's some easily preventable hacks. Some of them, the simple ones are the ones that are the most dangerous, right? And we really need to think about it. Um, I remember a conversation that Dave had and I at an event a couple of months ago, right after the um, vow that we shall not speak about incident happened. And he said, a simple, simple look at their process would have stopped this whole thing, but they just didn't let the people in, right? There wasn't even a board of directors, right? Uh, give me a freaking break, right? Yep. That's kind of what gets into it. Um, the Axie Infinity hack, that's when we were talking about before. If anybody wants to look into that, simple hacks. Um, but Dave is optimistic on web security. Regulation is needed, but we have to be mindful here, especially for the U.S. government regulation here. We want to don't want to take any missteps that really are going to push a lot of uh, folks you know, offshore because that's just going to open up a whole can of worms here. Um, and how do we scale security? That's really what it's all about. Uh, and more training on the threats. That's really what's going to open up other people. See, there's a lot here. This is a summary. You know, I'm literally distilling it here. Stop chasing the yield, people. Stop chasing the yield. That's going to be a big thing here. Um, that's important. We need to educate retail and we need to build a framework for mitigating systemic risk. And we talked a little bit about off-train risks, you know, how some of those old school hacks happen there. And ultimately, do not create a race to other jurisdictions. We said about it before. We don't want to push yes. people away there. So been a great chat with Dave. Anything else you want to add, Kevin? If the U.S. government is only giving you 4.5%, you're not getting 10% anywhere else, guys. No. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Please check out Dave on his social, tw uh, Twitter at mm -hmm. dschwed and, and LinkedIn. You can search him at David S. Schwed. And then for Halborn's website and socials, we got halborn.com, at Twitter, at Halborn Security, and then LinkedIn and YouTube, you can just search Halborn. And to everyone listening at home, I greatly appreciate you for joining us on the Immutable Mindset. And please follow us on all our socials. Just search at Immutable Show. Subscribe, comment, and network. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, Catch us Dave. next week for more. And take care, y'all. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.